You're listening to the Second Look Podcast, where we take a closer look at what we're learning each Sunday at Connection Church to help you grow in your walk with Christ. Here are your hosts, Pastor Joe Terreri and Pastor Dan DeRochers. Welcome to The Second Look. My name is Dan, and I am here with a very special guest who has never listened to or seen this podcast before, Henry Smith. Welcome, Henry. It's great to be here, Dan. (laughs) Desayunando con Dan. Here we are. That's right. So, uh, Henry, you have not, uh, you're not in any way familiar with the format or no the content idea. of this no podcast. Idea. You don't know what to expect. No idea. But what happens next is I say, hey, Henry, I have a question for you. Fire away. Uh, Henry, you, you mentioned the Lion King in your sermon yesterday. So yeah. here's my question. Okay. Do you have other Disney movie sermon illustrations <laughs> that you just go to? All the time. Um, I like that Lion King. There's just so many layers in that. Um, I love Nemo, Finding Nemo. Okay. The father heart looking for people and that type of thing. But yeah, yeah, don't get too preachy there, but that's a great <laughs> um, that's a great one too. I'm trying to think. Disney, yeah, that's... That's, uh, that's, that's probably, a, probably all that you can grab. That's about all of, I can yeah. get right now. Mighty Ducks. <laughs> I mean, I no, <laughs> wasn't a big Mighty Ducks fan. No, 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 no. So. So uh, you live in the city of Guayaquil, Ecuador. True story. Um, and you moved there in 1985. Yes. We won't. We won't have. We don't have to do the math. I was eight years old. Okay, you were yeah, eight years yeah, old. Very good. Forty years ago. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so you, but you're an American, right? Your parents yeah. are Americans, yeah. um, but you grew up largely. Uh, in that country, right. in that city, right. uh, what's it like for you to be, uh, you know, to have American roots, but yeah. to have been watered for most of your life in Ecuadorian soil? My wife says I'm a gringo pintado. I'm a painted gringo, so my my heart is Latin. Um, yeah, I you know it's what they call the third culture kid, right? To where you you don't really. There's certain parts of every culture that you identify with and fit in, and then there's certain parts of every culture that you don't. So you're kind of in the in-between land. And uh, there was a show growing up. It was kind of a uh, silly movie. It was called India Maria. And the, the the catch line was, ni de aquí, ni de allá. Not, e- not from here, not from there. Yeah. And uh, I, I was identified with that because, you, you know, there's certain parts. Clearly, I still like to be on time. And that's, yeah, that's an American part, right? thing, different, different from a Latin different culture. Thing. And they're like, "Here, Latin America." Yeah, but I just, to me, it's like if you tell me seven, I think seven. So, but yeah, there's definitely different. Every culture has its virtues, and every culture has its blind spots. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, uh, Pastor Centro Cristiano, Very in good. in Guayaquil, yeah. um, and that church your parents founded. And you became lead pastor. It was a bit of a, a transition kind of over the pandemic times and uh, became lead pastor there. Can mm-hmm. you tell us a little bit more about the church and then some of the, the satellite churches that you have and, and also the school? So um, I don't know how much history you want to get into, but when my parents got there in uh, 1985, there was a small little house church that was meeting about, about 50 people. And um, they asked him to lead it, and um, they did. And so they led that for 38 years. At the end of 2022, they handed the baton to my wife and I. And um, Now, the, the, during that time, this small little house church of 50 people grew to yeah. what? Uh, it's probably a community of about... Uh, probably about 15,000 by the time you include the school and the, the impact we have in the city. Yeah. Um, Dad was a big believer in cell groups, and this was before that, you know, now home groups or life groups, depending on the church. We call them now our oikos. Mm. Um, but They're that was... Based uh, on the yogurt? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah nice. <laughs> nice. Well played. Well played. Um, but that was really... I mean, obvi- I don't want to say the secret sauce, mm. Um the Lord's blessing and favor and mercy, obviously. But uh, the real motor was the small groups and empowering people to lead. And, you know, they would get their friends saved and discipled. And, and the cell groups were a big part of that. 
And so that was kind of, um, yeah, the history. He was very intentional about, you know, this is pre, um, he was always a student of leadership, always a student of um, cell group, and church, church structure, and, and that type of thing. But, uh, yeah. And then uh, several years ago, you started moving uh, into the urban slums. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about what life is like, you know, for a Jose and Patti or yeah. for a family who's living in, in the urban slum environment? So, yeah, we uh, we started that church plant in 2010, so about 14 years ago. Um, you know, one, one of the things that always surprises me when I'm, when I'm there is I think as Americans, we sometimes have this unconscious, I'm going to help them. Mm. And uh, there's a great book by Henry Nouwen called Gracias about his time in Peru. And he basically says that the, about the second year into it, I realized um, I wasn't there for them, but they were there for me. Wow. In the sense of um, you you begin to realize a few things in the slums is, is my, um, what is daily life like? Um, right now, it's a very violent context where they're at. Um, but people are people. And one of the things that always surprises me when I'm with the poor and is uh, sobering to me is, yes, they need hope. They need, you know, but some of them, it, it's amazing that with the little they have, the contentment that they mm. have. And uh, they can laugh and tell a good joke. And, yeah, they got, you know, trying to make ends meet and trying to put some food on the table and get schooling for their kids. But I think at the end of the day, human needs are human needs. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of life, um, loud and, you know, um, it's not, yeah. not necessarily possible to own land out there, right? For a lot of the people. Well, yes, yes and no. So the way, the way invasiones work or whether are the urban slums or marginal areas or undeveloped areas, whatever you call them, it's kind of like the mafia meets Oklahoma land run. Oh, so what will happen is um, an organized group of land traffickers will set their sights on a big area, and they're coming in from different provinces, and they will basically invade it. That's why it's called an invasion, an invasion. And um, with maybe 100 to 500 families that are kind of partnering with them, and the law is such in Ecuador that if you're on the land for five years, it's yours. Oh. So depending on how well financed or connected the owner of that land is and how big of a fight they want to put up, um, they will fight it out for five years. And then they will sell it to the poor. And, and so small lot by, let's say, seven meters by 15 meters. Well, you can buy it for two or three grand. Well, for a poor person, they say, you know, pay us $25 for X amount of years. Technically, you don't have a title, but what they call is a, a, a derecho de posesión, possessor's rights. So it's not legal, but when the city eventually will come in those areas, a decade or two later, um, they will grant title deeds to those and so it's kind of um that's not an ideal way of growing a city but that's the history of latin america wow and that's the way the urban slums by and large there usually is no pre-planning i mean there you know in the last probably a couple of decades some of the wealthier areas you will see some pre-planning and thought out phone lines and you know or underground or fiber optic or that type of thing but more and more the developing world, you're seeing the contrasts much more marked. One so. of the interesting things, I think, uh, culture-wise, is uh, access to water in a place like that. Something that that I yeah, would yeah. say all of us take for granted that we turn right, right, the, right. turn the tap and the right. water comes out. Mm -hmm. um, but water is very different in these places, yeah. and there's a whole industry dedicated to, to that. Could you tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, the water tank trucks. Yeah. Um, yeah, they need water. So there's, um, trucks that, you know, it's a big old truck with a big, kind of like those diesel gas drums, you know, and they fill them up at the local water. And then for like usually a dollar, they'll fill up your 55 gallon drum. 
and that's where people are getting their water to bathe and and uh, cook. And so, but yeah, even at our you know our church plant there, we'd have a big. It was a much bigger one, but you know, fill it up for five dollars. <laughs> but it it adds up. I mean, yeah. it sounds like it's nothing, but if you're if you're a family and you're having to fill that up every day. Well, that's a dollar a day. It's yeah. in a month. That's thirty dollars a month in water bill in the slums. That's a lot of money. Yeah, that's so, in some cases al- almost what you're yeah. paying for yeah. nor- for water service at a home. Well, even you know, even, even more. Here. It's even yeah. In, in Ecuador, it's more. If you're paying a dollar a day, um, that's actually more than my water bill at our home, and we live like at a you know a, a different area. Right. But you would pay in in a. In a big month, twenty five dollars, and that was like, oh, we're spending a lot of you know water. But so I mean, everybody's not every day. But if there's a big family and they got to fill that thing every day, but it's you know, fifteen to thirty dollars a month for a person. Extreme world poverty line is a dollar per person per day. Right. So it's it adds percentage. up. Yeah, it's a big percentage. Sure, for sure. One of the things that you said yesterday was that a Christ centered education is a way out. Right. of this right. and there's uh, I just love your vision that mm-hmm. um, you know the next or a, a next president of Ecuador could well be, we, we be joke about that there. I you but know I, but I think it's possible and my dad my dad would always joke with the director about it being cool to have a president I I guess I am I'm a little like yeah I I don't want I want to change from the bottom up you know mm-hmm. and so I'm always concerned if we get a president who said who's one of us but there is no you know integrity is important justice is important so yeah i mean we just who knows who knows what the lord's gonna do and but i guess my point is that that life change is happening absolutely in the walls of those schools absolutely absolutely and kids are pliable yeah my mom always says uh you know wet cement they're wet cement and so we are hopefully shaping mindset of a generation Fear of the Lord is a big thing for us. What's right uh, in a culture that believes la mentalidad del sabido, the, the mindset of the wise guy. Um, if you can get one up on me, you will. Yeah. If you drop a quarter, I put my foot on it and pretend nothing's happened. Usually in a culture that's a little more um, justice and right, here, you drop this quarter, this is yours. But... The mindset of the sabido, it's like James talks about the two different types of wisdom, you know, is if I can take advantage of you, yeah, too bad for you. Yeah. You know, so, but yeah, we, that's a, that's a long process because you're changing generational mindsets. Um, if somebody isn't seeing that as stealing, as it's not wrong, well, then why would you steal millions once you get to the higher levels? Right. So, um, yeah, it's and my wife is pretty, pretty intense. Well, and, and intentionally intense with the kids of right is right, you know, yeah. and um, there is truth, and uh, so it's little by little we're planting seeds, you know. Yeah, so. I think one thing interesting about your comments that I just want to call out here is, you know, when when I think about education being the way out i think of upward mobility and economic yeah. sustainability and yeah. and working their yeah. way out of the slums and those kind of things but Absolutely. but it, which is part of it of course yeah. but what i love about what you said is it's about integrity like it yeah. like you're not focusing on that you're focusing yeah. on a fear of the lord yeah. and training them up in the way that they should go and that's i mean that's that's forever a challenge because we're in a world that 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 you know education is becoming more accessible and that's all good but the the challenge of Romans 1 is education alone those professing to be wise man we're freaking brilliant um but those professing to be wise will become foolish mm. if they're if if that knowledge isn't rooted in the lord and i think of here we are back east and you have, you know, Yale and Harvard and all this stuff. Yeah. And that's the history of that, where they started out as seminaries right. 400 years ago. And education for the sake of education, it's kind of like growth. Growth for the sake of growth in a church is dangerous. Yeah. If it's not sustainable, if there's not intentionality behind it. And I think the truth is education, education just for the sake of being educated 
um, if it's not rooted in a fear of the Lord, in a deeper purpose, in the truth, um, it'll undermine you in the end. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the whole Romans, that sequence is so powerful. You know, they forgot to worship and thank God, therefore God gives them up to the, you know, their own desires and they, and they profess to be, and that's kind of context of America right now. We have people out of education, but um, it not only, it doesn't help them, but it undermines them yeah. if um, there isn't a fear of the Lord. And so, yeah. Well, that's such a huge part for people that, that do have kids, especially school-age kids. It's a huge part of trying to pursue the, the, the right education. There's sure. a lot of educational opportunities that are out there, private school, public school, charter schools. There's just so many options but we are also simultaneously trying to uh, establish a faith base for our kids. Right. right um, how right. do you approach that with your kids, uh, with kids in the schools? Like, right. what? Obviously, we all have our own hearts. Our kids have our own hearts. You have to own your faith in a lot of ways. But what are things that you do or have done to really help to build a solid foundation for your kids? Well, I think, I mean, I'm pretty basic. Um, I think it all starts in living it, you know, first. I mean, um, you know, how many times do you hear of either a preacher's home or Christian home that they were believing all the right stuff, yeah, but they weren't living it and cutting corners. And, and so I think for me, you can't, you can't, um, you, you, you can't, emphasize enough the importance of you must live it yeah and you want a healthy home there needs to be a healthy marriage you want a healthy marriage there needs to be a healthy you and so it all it all is sequential um i think I, and the other things too i remember years ago hearing a quote god doesn't have grandkids and he only mm. has kids mm -hmm. and so um yeah it doesn't matter if your dad's billy graham or charles manson yeah. Um, if there isn't a relationship with the father, the, there's no relationship. It yeah. doesn't matter who your dad is. And so I think as parents, the dynamic of training them up in the way of the Lord, but also having enough, um, allowing enough room to where the Lord operates in their life. How can they see that they're a sinner? How can they see that they need a savior if there is such a perfection I mean, that, that dynamic is a tricky one. I remember when we were in youth ministry, we'd always talk about parenting, like holding the egg, right? If you squeeze it too tight, and I remember college, went to Bible school and all that, and the people who usually most lost it were the people who were brought up in a very legalistic, high pressure. Yeah, interesting. And they would go to college, and they'd just freak out. They didn't know what to do with that much freedom. And so... Um, Loose enough to where you don't crush it, but if it's too loose, you'll drop it and break the egg. And so it's that dynamic of, you know, Joshua, me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Yes, but also they're growing, and I want them to experience a true relationship with the Holy Spirit and learn His voice. And if, if they don't value it, I can, I mean, you're not going to spank it into them. Right. You know, I mean, right. they have, they, there has to be a um, a true relationship there. So, yeah. yeah, and I mean, your kids are walking in the ways of the Lord, yeah. and it's it, what a gift that Absolutely. you have for Absolutely. that. And um, I think it's a very interesting encouragement to for maybe maybe someone needed to hear that today to yeah. loosen up a little yeah, bit, yeah. loosen your yeah. grip a little bit. Yeah, it's a tricky thing because we're, I mean, my wife and I, we're very, you know, you hear about the helicopter parents, but right. but we're pretty like... You guys are more like drone parents, right? Yeah, well, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're pretty extreme as far as like, you know, growing up with the amount of abuse that you hear about and stuff. We didn't do sleepovers and stuff with our kids. Yeah. So like we, we were very, um, very protective just because of all, you know, life and stuff. Uh, it's just a different day. That being said, though, you know, it's the dynamic. And I teasingly, with my kids, I joke, my, my wife's, you know, she's um, she's quite the intercessor and, and has credible discernment. It's like, it's kind of 
too bad your mom's an intercessor. You don't get away with anything, you know, because like <laughs> stuff that they'll think, you know, nobody knows. And then the Lord gives my wife a dream or something. And it's just like, oh, wow, there it is. <laughs> so, but I think that, I mean, that puts a healthy fear of the Lord in you. God is God. He loves you so much that, and it's like our own life too, you know, reading the Proverbs today. It's like, you know, the idea that he loves if he loves you, he's going to correct you. It's correction. It's such a hard word for us. Correction or discipline. It's like, you know, repentance. Those are words that are like, ah. But those are good words. Those yeah. are good words. Those are tender words. Those are words of a father saying, man, I got I got good stuff for you. I, I, I Stay close to me. I don't, you know, there's, there's something better here. So Yeah. Well, we're so grateful that you would take time to be with us here today and this weekend. What a joy to have you. This is it's just only like your second or third time on the East Coast, right? It is. It is. I'm getting used to it. Different vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> different vibe, different time zone. Yeah, so yeah, thanks yeah. so much for being here with us. Well, this has been another episode of The Second Look. You can catch this sermon and a whole lot more at our website, come to connect.com. Have a great week. Mm-hmm.